Hi folks, Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Kat, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ryan. So Kat, I'll start with a the cocktail question, which is somewhat hard to answer for some folks, is if someone were to ask you at a cocktail party, what do you do? How do you answer that question? Um, it's funny because I do struggle with that. I usually say I work for a very unusual bank. It's important for people to know that banking can be done well, but it's not axiomatic in their minds. So I have to add that unusual word. And it piques my interest. So what, how do you, so then they say, okay, tell me more. What does that mean, an unusual bank? Yes, and it always does, which is good. <laughs> um, so we're a, an extremely values-driven bank that recognizes the deeply profound um, and public interest role of banking in our society. We are trying to change the banking system for good because it belongs to all of us. It's very, very powerful and impactful. And when it's good, it's very, very good. But when it's bad, it's very, very bad. So we need to take control of it again and make it work in the public interest. That's not what people have typically experienced in the last 30 to 40 years, unless they were fortunate enough to be with a community bank or a community development financial institution um, or a large regional bank that just gets it that they need to serve a myriad of stakeholders, including the public interest, as they uh, do banking for us all. Now, before we get, uh, I'm going to ask a lot of questions about Beneficial State Bank. and. I think you have some banking history within your family. You know, how did you, how did you decide of all the issues? You know, I, I've noticed you're involved in things like, you know, the Prison Insight Project, or you were, you know, climate change, regenerative agriculture, immigration reform, investigative journalism. H how did you decide? Okay, banking is where I need to spend the majority of my time and energy. Yes, I did not think I was going to be a banker when I was growing up. I was deeply influenced by the civil rights movement, and I wanted to address all those issues. But in fact, banking touches just about everything in life. Um, and I did have the perspective of growing up in a family my, um, that was very invested in banking. My grandfather, who didn't graduate from high school, um, came from Montana, became a bank examiner, and rose through those ranks and uh, then joined with a source of capital, the Crocker family, and a very, very consummate banker, um, the Fleischhacker family, and um, uh, put together 47 or 48 banks that eventually became Crocker Bank. And Crocker Bank actually, by all accounts that I have, was uh, a very good bank, responsible to the community, respectful of the planet, in relationship with communities, the high road employer, it was a great bank, and a lot of the regionals were like that, um, you know, back in those times, which was the 1950s and 60s and on into the 70s. 
but I honestly didn't think that's where I was headed. I just got exposed to relationship banking early in life. Much later, when the civil rights leadership in this country was um, pronouncing that political and legal rights would be hollow victories if they didn't lead to real economic opportunity and prosperity for all, that's when the banking scene came back into my life. And so after graduate school, I was following very closely the uh, large, pioneering, socially responsible banks like South Shore Bank in Chicago, Self Help Credit Union in North Carolina, and Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. And that's what led me back eventually into banking. From Beneficial State Bank, so then talk about your decision to start a bank. So, you know, some people would say, I'm going to go work for Grameen Bank or Shore Bank. You know, why did you decide I'm going to actually start one from scratch? <laughs> Good question. So uh, when I was in my 20s, I actually um, wanted to work uh, in the nonprofit community economic development sector. And a close friend now and mentor then, Michael Kieschnick, who uh, worked for Jerry Brown in his first administration as the economic development czar, um, advised me on an informational interview that with my family banking experience, I should get myself uh, skilled up in banking and start a bank. I thought he was insane at the time, to be honest, because I had two dimes to rub together. But I did go to work for Wells Fargo and go through the credit training program. Underwriting, which is the ability to analyze and manage risk, it's central to making loans that actually get paid back and create value, um, is a skill um, that's learned partly uh, in the classroom but a lot experientially. I didn't spend a long time in credit, but uh, I now recognize in the U.S. economy that we could use a lot more underwriting skill, and I always encourage young people, if they're interested, to go get that. We hire people with underwriting skill every chance we get, and we depend on it very much. But I did uh, do some banking in my 20s. I then I'm not going to tell you my whole life story, don't worry. But I left banking. Uh, I went into a political life of my husband raising money for democratic politics. I served on many, many nonprofit boards. We raised a family of four kids. Um, everything was going along swimmingly until we were supposed to go to Washington, D.C. with John Kerry's administration. If you remember, we went to sleep thinking John Kerry was elected, and we woke up to find, find out that he was not and that would turn out to be a devastating turning point in American politics, in our view. And we've spent every waking moment since then trying to address systemically equitable, uh, just development everywhere we can, energy, food, money, politics, because we've got to get this country back on track. And that's what led us to think maybe we should, in fact, start a bank. We had the resources to do it. We barely made it through the closing window. Uh, the bank was chartered as one California bank in 2007. Um, immediately thereafter, the credit markets burned down, and the seeds of destruction sowed in part by the banking industry came to fruition, and we had the Great Recession. Um, so we're grateful to be a chartered bank. Um, we do think uh, that uh, we need to change the banking system for good. I can go into why it's so powerful, why we need that uh, shift to happen, but we start with a bank model that's unique. Um, uh, we've spent um, since 2007 proving that the unique bank model that we have does serve the public interest in a way that's economically resilient, and now uh, we are spreading the mo this model of banking as fast and furious as we can through every device we can think of, our own organic growth, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and trying to influence the main banking players that this is a better way to take market share. What are some of those uh, systemic issues, starting a bank versus maybe a credit union or something mm -hmm. else, that, that this is a, a favorable approach? Right. So actually, we're as close to a credit union as a bank can come, and we love well-run credit unions. They serve a lot of the design features that I'll tell you are critical, to, we think, to changing the banking system for good. Um, so uh, why care about banking at all? Banking, to us, is the original and most powerful form of crowdfunding. We decided to pool our deposits as American uh, bank customers because that's a handy way to make that capital available to finance the economy that we want to live within. 
and to be available for our own borrowing and transactional needs when we need it. Life doesn't roll out in a a steady complementary stream of expenses and income. We have these lumpy events like buying a car, buying a house, sending someone to college. So we need a source of financing for our our own individual needs, but we also need financing to help um, uh, cash flow the economy and the growth in the economy and provide the goods and services that we want. Um, That means um, that not that a specific deposit funds a specific loan, but all deposits fund a lending practice. So we wanted to design a bank that was respectful to all the constituencies that make that financing possible. The um, banking system is enabled by FDIC insurance. That is insurance that's backed ultimately by the American taxpayer and allows all of us to place up to $250,000 currently under the limits um, uh, per legally separate account in a bank risk-free, meaning we cannot lose that money because even if that bank failed, the FDIC insurance fund would make us whole. That means that it enables deposit gathering at a very efficient rate and a very low cost. Our cost of funds at the bank right now is about 40 basis points. If you go to the capital markets, you're pretty lucky to be a company that raises money at, say, 3% or something like that. So that low-cost funding that's enabled by FDIC insurance is absolutely the rocket fuel that makes the American economy work alongside the capital markets. It's also put into a model that's inherently leveraged. So even at a very conservative capital ratio, which we are required to maintain by regulation of 10%, it means we're 10 times levered. Every $1 of equity that we recruit, we get to pair with 9 or $10 of deposit funding. So you can see the sort of exponential effect even before you get to what's called the fractional reserve system, which is how credit is further amplified in the money supply for the banking system. It's also a very disciplined process. I talked about underwriting. We have to make sure that at least 98 cents of every dollar lent is coming back to us um, or else we would be financially imperiled and in trouble with our regulators. So we're deadly serious about underwriting and managing risk. And then finally, it's recycling. So those 98 cents come back to be relent again. The effect of lending is very, very cumulative. So all of that powerful influence in our philosophy needs to serve the main stakeholders of the banking system, who are the American taxpayer, our bank customers, the communities that, that host those economies, the environment upon which we all depend, the public interest um, that, is, that holds the firm ground rules of how we're going to treat one another and have broad equity. Um, and therefore, we need to develop a bank that's respectful to the power of that system and to the stakeholders to which it is owing its respect. The way we did that was we gave 100% of the economic rights of the bank to a public charity foundation that is permanently governed in the public interest. So you were speaking um, in your uh, preface about the point of lift economy. One of the um, virtues that we hold very dear is aligned governance. Our board that holds the economic stock of the bank must always be uh, represent the broad public interest, can never be controlled by a private individual. It gets its re- um, representatives appointed by three other public charities, Bridge Housing that represents to us um, access to safe and affordable housing, the Tides Foundation that represents fair and equitable community development, and East Bay College Fund, which represents access to higher education for all. So those entities appoint our board in the majority, and that after that, um, they also have a duty to our bylaws and the public charity bylaws support uh, everything that I just talked about, plus um, mandate that any profits that are received through the dividending process from the economic rights in the bank must be reinvested back into the low-income communities that we serve and the environment. So there's a sort of virtuous profit-taking to mimic the crowdfunding on the front. That governance alignment is as strong as we've been able to make it, but we also 
adhere to standards like B Corp. We're a highly rated B Corporation because we want to live up to high principles of governance and labor practices, everything. So that's design feature number one. Two, um, we need to care about the lending practice, that it reflects the values of our stakeholder communities. So we insist that 75% of loan dollars out there through our lending process are producing affordable housing, sustainable food, renewable energy, or in the hands of aligned business entities like B corporations and worker cooperatives, or um, prioritized to communities previously starved of bank capital uh, through redlining like low-income communities, um, small, uh, women and minority-owned businesses, small business in general, the nonprofit and social sector. And the other 25% of our loan dollars can't be working against the triple bottom line of uh, social justice, environmental well-being, and economic sustainability. So that means that a preponderance of our loan dollars are supporting what I would characterize as the new economy, an economy that's fully inclusive, racially and gender just, and environmentally restorative. <clears throat> that's the lending practice that we need to evidence to our stakeholders every quarter. So we run output metrics and outcome metrics, like how many affordable housing units, how much renewable energy, um, and then we very carefully govern the other 25% to make sure it's not contramission. The third design feature is radical transparency, and I mean radical. So even beyond what we disclose about our lending practice, even beyond the self-assessment we take through B Corporation um, and just labeling and the CDFI process at Treasury, we make commitments like we pay 150% of living wage fully benefited in all markets, we will not lend to coal, oil, or gas, we sign the Small Business Bill of Rights, and we make those very public. We also measure how we show up as a corporation in the American business setting, so we measure our greenhouse gas footprint, landfill, water, and try to push that down per FTE every year, mitigate that which we can't. That radical transparency is super important because if you think about our lending practice, that is mimicked in the CRA-driven activities of the big banks. That's what they hold up like a shiny, bright object that we're all very respectful of. They do it bigger, better, faster, stronger, to be honest. They, they finance a lot of affordable housing, for instance, a lot of renewable energy. But they also drag a train of misery behind it that is the antithesis of those certifications and commitments that we've made. So one-third of bank tellers nationwide are on some form of public assistance in one of the most profitable industries in the world. Uh, the um, housing, auto, and student loan bubbles have been absolutely enabled and promoted by bank lending practices. Auto lending right now is particularly egregious. Uh, the fossil fuel economy has enjoyed the privilege of corporate bank finance from day one, and it's not getting any less of it now. Uh, $255 billion of fines have been paid for consumer abuses in the banking space since 2008 alone, and it's merely a cost of doing business. Those are still wildly lucrative act bank activities, and they don't stop because of those penalties. So the train of misery is what we have to stop. So we need the bank model to be economically resilient and deliver all that value and show up what other bad banking practices are happening so that the constituent groups can say to their bank, for whatever you do, don't do those things or I'm out of here. Um, just to say the last thing, our theory of change is not that we're going to become the banking system. There are $12 trillion in the banking system. B of A and Chase uh, banks are both over $2 trillion in assets. These are massive institutions. We're $800 million with an M, no, not even close to, a, not close to a B, but, you know, the T, the size of this industry is just horrifying in some respects. But so we're not going to replace them, but in between us and them sit well-positioned large regional banks who are competing fiercely with those big money center banks. And if they see that we can recruit deposit capital, meaning bank customers, equity capital, meaning investors, and human capital, meaning smart young people who want a values-aligned profession, we hope that they will mimic our behaviors to steal that market share from the big banks and that's the way the banking system can change for good.
you know, one of the questions I've struggled with, maybe you could provide some insight is, you know, taking a, a level up to the meta of the actual capitalist system and how money, you know, our economy is based on growth at a certain percentage per year. Is capitalism itself and growing growing the economy, is that going to lead to catastrophic failure? Yeah, so I um, I am very susceptible to the no growth argument. I it is hard to, um, especially if you have very uh, unevenly distributed prosperity. If you throw into that equation no growth, it's really hard to shift the prosperity to more broadly held. So I'm in favor, and, and this is true at the bank too. We are in favor of reasonable growth. We are not in favor of big as some sort of virtue. So our growth plans through organic growth, through aligned mergers and acquisition, is to um, grow the bank to maybe $2 billion to $5 billion in assets. That's still exponentially smaller than these big banks. And what we don't agree with about largeness is we can never uh, get big so that we aren't responsive. The flip side of accountability is responsiveness. If we get too big, we won't understand our communities. We won't understand our impact on the environment and so on. So we have built in inherent limitations on our own growth. And I would say our, you know, less developed is, is our sense collectively as a bank of how the economy should govern growth or could govern growth to be sustainable and regenerative, but we're part of those conversations. Um, and we just need to keep um, sort of the dual goals in mind of a capitalist economy that lives within ecological limits, but also shares prosperity as broadly as possible. And we've got so much work on that latter one, but we totally understand. So, like, if I want to hold up the benchmarks of most concern to us, it's, what is it now, 12 years to 2 degrees Celsius temperature change, that's something we can never get to, and it's it's so urgent, um, but also the worst income and wealth disparity the country's ever seen. That is also, uh, you know, just um, a highly volatile political condition that's deeply unethical. You just acquired uh, a bank, a banking, a series of banks, or, or a bank with many branches in yeah. the Central Valley. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you know, I'm from Fresno originally, so I was excited to hear oh, that Beneficial State awesome. Bank is moving to Fresno. Um, yeah. So what's the, what's the strategy behind acquiring? I've never understood acquiring another bank and like the benefits and drawbacks of doing so. Right. Yeah. So um, we have a philosophy about growth that includes organic growth and mergers and acquisition partly because of the urgency I just me mentioned. Um, we need to change the banking system for good in a time frame that will actually get at our climate, averting climate disaster and get at restoring income and wealth prosperity for all in very short order. And growing organically while we've been doing it um, out of size, meaning above industry averages, is just too slow a way to get there from a size standpoint and from a product offering standpoint. So our phil philosophy around mergers and acquisitions is we will not seek a partnership with an unaligned, meaning they have to be a values-driven organization. They may not have all the certifications, but you kind of know it by how they approach the business. Uh, we would never do anything that wasn't voluntary. Uh, the other side has to want it just like we do. Uh, we do it to increase our influence from a size standpoint so that we can catch the attention of those large regionals and they can think, oh, there's a reasonably sized community bank that's doing something very interesting so that we can be economically resilient. Banking has very high overhead, partly because of the technology platforms that um, – we need to rely on and have to be evolving all the time, and partly because of a very high but appropriate compliance burden that we have to meet um, to not not just for the safety and soundness of the bank, which is protecting the FDIC insurance fund ultimately, but all, all sorts of other compliance responsibilities that we totally embrace, like fair lending and data security and customer privacy and et cetera. So knowing that the overhead burden is out there, we have to plan for a size that can handle that, um, and that suggests 
bigger scale than we are right now, although we're we're handling it, but it's it, it will probably get bigger as uh, life goes on here. Um, and then geographically, uh, we serve the three West Coast states, Washington, Oregon, and California, but we're spotty. We have branches, um, Seattle, Portland, Oakland, Sacramento, Santa Rosa, but that doesn't allow us yet to sort of extend into central and southern California, much less into San Diego County and Inland Empire, where half of Californians now live south of Ventura Boulevard. So geographically, we need to be a little, a little bit bigger to really serve our territory. And in terms of product offering, we are um, keenly focused on a suite of products that would attend to working class families, low income communities, and the environment, what those constituents need in terms of bank products. So, um, uh, for instance, um, the banks that we are about to merge with um, include Finance and Thrift and Pan American Bank. Finance and Thrift um, bought Pan American just in the last year. Uh, Finance and Thrift has five locations in the Central Valley, uh, Modesto, Fresno, uh, Visalia, Porterville, and Bakersfield, so really critical ge geographies in California. Those correlate very highly with large Latino populations. They are places where the economy is in flux. Um, they uh, have a lot of unmet banking needs, and that bank is a very high road auto lender. Auto lending is really important in those communities because there isn't reasonable mass transit, um, and if you don't have a car, it's very hard to have employment. There's a lot of abuse in auto lending uh, by the big banks, so to have a deeply responsible auto lender is also very, very important and it creates a platform for us to get more people into hybrids and electric vehicles with available public subsidies in some cases, but also just by extending fair auto lending terms. Auto lending has suffered, uh, especially for working class people, from what's called uh, dealer rate ads. Um, the finance companies uh, um, who support the dealer network often give dealers half of whatever rate they can add in the sales process to what the person actually qualifies for, which is just overcharging for debt. There are sham warranties uh, sold that nobody could ever reasonably collect on, and there's um, overfinancing of used vehicles, like 180% of loan to value, which is really just backing into a predatory consumer loan. So um, that's one example of both ge geographic spread and product offering. It's very important to us getting this job done. Um, uh, similarly, Pan American Bank is in East L.A. and North Hollywood, um, East L.A. Boyle Heights, very important neighborhood to serve with beneficial banking services. And we'll keep looking for partners so that we can get in deeper to Southern California and then infill. Right now, I don't think we have the capacity or the can to serve rural economies, and those rural economies are really looking for a new business plan, if you will, so um, we have a lot more work to do, and uh, uh, we are stronger together than we can be apart. So these mergers, I really think of as partnerships, um, and that's what it feels like, too. So what can folks, you know, obviously opening a bank account at Beneficial State Bank is, is probably a, a good step. Are there other ways that listeners can support what you're doing? Yes. In fact, um, changing your banking relationship has not been made easy, <laughs> and it's getting harder all the time. So we like to give people a lot of options. Of course, we would love for them to become beneficial state bank customers. We would be honored to serve them, and it's good for our business and our impact. Um, you can also just simply look at um, the way that our bank is serving and ask your own bank, like, you know, let me see your lending practice. Uh, what, how do your fees stack up to everyone else? What's your um, consumer um, uh, complaint record? Those sorts of things. Like, make them aware that you're, you have opinions, and those should be respected in that context. Um, if you're interested in banking, it's a, an awesome career. To me, I get to have a front row seat into every sector of the economy, and it's fascinating, especially where it's changing rapidly. So coming to work with us, we run an internship program every summer for college and graduate students, um, 10 or 12 a summer. It's a wonderful program uh, with um, a real uh, 
um, project that's mentored by someone in the bank, but also a core curriculum that covers banking and has great speakers and so on. So coming to work for the bank or um, just talking to other people about banking, I'm so appreciative of the big short because banking has not been sexy for a long time. People don't really want to talk about it, but it's so important for us to talk about it because it's very influential, it's ubiquitous, it's in everybody's supply chain, but it's invisible, and so you just don't get deep American conversations about banking. People know that there's something wrong, and um, the Move Your Money movement and even Occupy, you know, was was um, almost instinctively aware that something was harming them, but there wasn't a good alternative. So that's what we've got to do is create an alternative, a robust conversation, and give people avenues to change um, and have a little fun doing it, by the way, as well. So I also um, am uh, a fan of our Reich and Inequality Media and you know, just having more conversations with people who can distill this down to something we can all understand um, and have concrete, constructive suggestions of how we could change things would be very helpful. And what about capital needs? Are you um, <laughs> are you seeking any capital? Yes, thank you. Yes, <laughs> um, I didn't mean to leave that off the table. But we are um, uh, just as of this summer uh, going out and making presentations to impact investors in order to preserve preserve our unique ownership. Uh, model, meaning 100% of economic rights held in a public charity of some sort, we are only presenting the opportunity to buy stock in the bank to charitable vehicles, but that's fine um, too. And actually for an impact investor, um, we've, this is not a stock offering, but generally speaking, we've designed an instrument we think would give them what, what we call liquidity, some current return so they can keep making some grants off of the um, income from the investment, um, but they get the pro rata share of our impact. And for all those reasons, the leverage in the bank model, the low-cost funding, the recycling, the business discipline, everything else, uh, it's very impactful. And I think it will stack up very well in their portfolio of impact investments for that reason. If anybody would like to learn more about it, uh, we'll be on the road from now through the next 18 months. Um, making the pitch the road show the road show yeah you mentioned robert reich is there who else do you look to i, I think robert reich does a fantastic job of explaining the the capital markets and the economic system in ways that the average folks can understand are there are yes. there other resources or organizations or thought leaders that you point to as being able to to really distill the information in ways that people can can uh, understand yeah. Um, so uh, I would put in the same category um, color of change and story of stuff project and a lot of other kind of um, movement makers who we pay a lot of attention to, um, Black Lives Matter, but, you know, sort of that are great um, populist movements as well, which I think is really important. And then a little more on the thought leadership. It sounds more academic, but actually they're practice organizations too. The Global Alliance for Banking on Values, which is um, 25 or 27 banks all, from all over the world who are values-driven like us. Most of them are much bigger than us and have been at this for longer, so they have a lot of deep wisdom. Um, and that trade association, if you will, or light secretariat, does a good job of articulating what values-based banking means, what it can produce, how it's practiced, everything else. So that's another good source. The Community Development Bankers Association, which is a strong trade association for us here in the States, is comprised of about half of the community development financial institution banks. That's a treasury designation. It's very hard to get and to keep. Um, uh, so they do a lot of really great work, n not um, only with the banks, but on Capitol Hill with politicians and so on. Um, the CDFI fund itself, the Department of Business Oversight, is our California regulator, and uh, Jan Owens is ahead. They are very strong in a lot of financial reform. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau are heroes. Um, a lot of banks hate hate the uh, additional regulations brought on by Dodd-Frank, but 
uh, while you know it's hard to make a regulatory system super efficient, we concede that it's very important. These are principles and standards that must be upheld, like fair lending, and uh, so we think the CFPB is is a welcome institution and doing a great job. Elizabeth Warren has been very outspoken, um, the senator from Massachusetts. She is also probably the nation's leading expert on bankruptcy. And when you understand bankruptcy, you understand a lot about uh, uh, the, you know, the foibles of a market-based economy, of uh, politics in the economy, of uh, the undue burden that the working poor have paid in this system, et cetera. So uh, there's no shortage of heroes. Um, I think we're all just hoping that we can seep into the American consciousness about how important it is if we're going to give people a fair shake to address banking, which is so central to almost every other industry that I can think of. Well, I think you're doing a great job in a, in, in a way because you're making it <clears> – <throat> there's there's public events that have happened, and you're making it cool. You know, Beneficial State Bank is a really awesome organization, so I think just having you as a thought, leading, thought leader and a thought-leading organization is really helping. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, because most people think banking is pretty boring, but we're trying to spice it up a little bit. Uh, so a few sort of off-the-wall questions here. Um, what do people never ask you that you wish they did? Um, probably where should I bank? And I, and I mean that from... I am really lucky. I get to do a lot of really fun, interesting things. So we run two venture funds alongside the bank, and we have portfolio companies, and we meet a lot of startups, uh, and so many of them are super values-driven. Like uh, That's the whole reason they're in business is to change the world. And if they're fortunate enough to raise venture money, they get a slug of money like $5 million cash. And they run over and put it often right into one of the big money center banks. And I'll be like, oh, gee, like that invisible supply chain effect, that's part of your, that's part of your um, footprint on this earth. You know, you can, you can have alignment. You, you just, if we can just make you aware. Um, uh, similarly, uh, some of the great, I won't name these names because I'll sound like I'm criticizing them, but a lot, there's a lot of nonprofits trying to help large corporates be socially responsible and environmentally responsible too. Um, and they rarely talk to them about their banking um, because it alienates an important um, donor constituency, honestly. The big banks give – they actually don't give that much money away. If you look at how much money they give away – I think it's something like 1% to 2% of their profit at best, in the best case. We give um, – eventually we'll give all the profit away, but we're not allowed to distribute all our profit right now, and we, it wouldn't be prudent as a growing organization. But we give the equivalent of 5 to 10% of our profit away every year. So, But anyway, the, these bigger banks use that money a lot to kind of keep captive certain communities. And so – so, of course, nobody wants to say if one of them gave you a large grant to all those companies that showed up for the consultation on social responsibility, by the way, don't be caught dead in one of the big banks. Um, but we need to say that. We really need to say that. If you look at um, the political lobby of the big banks, it is massive. Dodd, the ink was no sooner dry on Dodd-Frank which wasn't a perfect bill, but an attempt at important re-regulation of the bank after the crisis, which, you know, that was a bank-driven Great Recession. Uh, I, there were hundreds of lawyers dismantling that as fast as they could, and they're still in there. There's The big banks are right now arguing that um, uh, the capital requirements, which are uh, increased capital buffer to keep the system safe from large banks failing, should be, you know, exempted from the capital calculation should be derivatives or, you know, so the, it's a relentless push by financial interest to water down regulation. And um, the lever that we as the public have 
or we as startups or we as business associations or we as American business is to just not tolerate that kind of behavior and switch your bank. Go to a bank that's not going to do that. You know, what's interesting is I've, I've noticed that one of the best ways to help a company change their bank is on the B Corp B Corp assessment process. You get points <laughs> if you have a benefit, yes, if you have a yep. B Corp bank or a you know community development bank or a credit union or a local bank. And I've I've helped so many companies, and I got to that question, and they're like, oh yeah, we should switch banks because we'll get like one point on this B Corp assessment. So it's just funny how uh, giving someone like a point, whether whether or not that point itself is is meaningful, actually encourages change. So uh, yes, yeah. yeah. In fact, not to, we're not trying to um, grab credit or anything, but when we went through the assessment several years ago, uh, there, there's only, I think maybe four banks had been through it before, and, um, and B-Lab is great because new sectors or new players come in and they'll um, engage them to constantly improve the assessment tool. And so there was a lot that we could contribute as a bank because, for instance, revenue for a bank is a different concept than for most other companies, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things we said to them is, uh, you don't have any questions on the general survey about source of financial services, and that's what we're all about. Why don't you ask people who their bank is? <laughs> and, so, and now it's actually working, as you just pointed out. Because if you get more points by having a good aligned bank, then you go have a good aligned bank. Yeah, it's it's funny. Human psychology is like, oh, status quo, status quo. Oh, points. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, well, thank you so much, Kat. Um, I guess w one of my last questions is, what what do you see as the what's the sort of twenty five, fifty, a hundred year plan for beneficial state bank? Do you do you want to be in every state in the U.S.? Do you want to ha have sort of other banks copy your model, but in beneficial state? state stay re re relatively small or regional or w what do you really see as the the change you're seeking in the longer term yeah so the most important one would be a migration of those large regionals to good relationship banking that's respectful of the environment regenerative of the environment and um serving uh public constituencies that matter the most and i actually see signs of that i'm not saying that we produce this but if you look at some of the bigger regional banks, they're starting to use our nomenclature. They're starting to compete on a relationship basis. They're starting to give um, their constituent customers voice. Um, I think uh, recently I saw a bank win the um, University of California's business, and I think they even pitched having a student council that would review financial products before they were allowed to be sold on campus. So just that, that's a really positive sign. Um, so we would hope to see more of that. We don't want to be larger in the main than what can serve efficiently the three West Coast states. We can't cover a bigger territory from a human being standpoint and really feel like we know it. Um, uh, and what meets bank economics, that compliance and technology overhead, 2 to $5 billion seems like about right to us. And um, so um, not to be big, not to be national or anything like that. The one exception would be if we have financial products that are very beneficial to people that can be licensed nationally. So all banks, especially community banks, can offer them. We'd do that in a heartbeat, you know, like a better auto loan, a better credit card, et cetera, um, because that's just good for the community banking system for their own um, commercial viability and for – the values that we're trying to drive to our bank customers countrywide. And where, where can folks learn more or about Beneficial State and your work? Uh, well, we have a website, www.beneficialstate.com. You notice we left the word bank out of there because it's kind of a four-letter word. Um, but also, if you go to the main website, and I'm sorry, I, I never remember the suffix, but we have a wholly dedicated separate impact website that tries to broadcast and chronicle the impact of the bank in a very transparent way so that I always recommend people go there. We're trying to upgrade it all the time, add new metrics. Um, it has our theory of change, our mission, our vision, everything else. So both of the websites are very good to check out and um, Sometime soon we will consummate this merger 
with Pan American Bank. Um, so Pan American Pan Am Bank dot com, I think, is their website. They will merge eventually, but you can find out a little bit about um, their banking practice as well. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.